Hi, everyone. This is Raquel. Hi, and this is Jennifer. Welcome to Madness Cafe. This is a feminist podcast where we talk about women's issues, politics, and health and wellness. And where those issues intersect. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. This is Raquel. This episode is going to be our Thanksgiving episode because this will air on Thursday, November 25th, which is in the U.S. is observed as Thanksgiving, U.S. Thanksgiving. We want to talk about some of the myths around it, how we can re- define or rethink the day, reimagine the day so that it's more inclusive, so that it doesn't just gloss over the negative and and true history of the relationship between Native Americans and, and the settlers, and so that it can be a better day for everyone, so that it actually is a day where people don't feel left out or excluded or put in any sort of box. Right on. Yes. So as kids here in the U.S., we are taught that Thanksgiving is all about the pilgrims and the Indians and the first Thanksgiving and everybody came together and they were happy and they had a party and they had turkey and They broke bread and had a big party and celebrated the harvest. That's not exactly true. I wish we could insert a record scratch noise right here because that was like, was that a good? Yeah, that works. Sure. (laughs) (laughs) I'll just make all of our own sound effects. Essentially, that's not how all of that went down. There's a whole history behind all that. And we just want to acknowledge that Jennifer and I are not experts at any of this. We're learning along with all of you about all of this. And I think, yeah, we knew to some extent that what we were taught as little kids and tracing your hand to make a turkey and all that kind of stuff, that we knew that that stuff wasn't true, but we're learning just like everybody else. And so we thought this would be a good way to sort of be in the arena with the rest of you. So here we go. Yeah. One of the myths is that the first Thanksgiving was the first time that anybody had given thanks for the harvest. And well, well, we all know that's not true, right? I mean, agrarian societies celebrate the harvest whenever they could, because that was the way that they were going to make it through winter. And they were giving thanks for having the, the, Bounty. supplies and everything the bounty right good word to make it through the winter mm-hmm. and in fact uh long before europeans set foot on these shores or pretty much any shores native peoples gave thanks every day for all of the gifts and of life and and the land and held thanksgiving celebrations at various times throughout the year so it wasn't just one day what that brings to mind for me one of the reasons why i have chosen to be a vegetarian and my family have chosen to be vegetarians is we are really really anti-factory farming Mm -hmm. there's so much we're not going to get into that that's a whole nother issue but one of the things that i have always really admired and respected and this is my belief about indigenous people Mm -hmm. my belief has been that they have always really honored the sacrifice of a life of an animal and really been purposeful in the utilization of every part of that animal and also kind of said a prayer of thanks for the one soul to nourish the other soul or the community of souls. And so to me, that has always been, people have said, could you be a hunter? I think I could be a hunter. Like if that was required of me and I needed to feed my family, Mm -hmm. if I were doing it in an honorable way that honored the gift of the animal to the family, yes, I think I could. And that's something I've always respected. So to me, that is a prayer of thanks. Every Mm -hmm. single time you're taking a life of another. That totally makes sense. And that's a great way to think about it. And there's more recognition of that there's increasing recognition of indigenous peoples using 
all that that animal had to give and in and using the the, the bones and the, the, I mean, the, every part of it, it wasn't just, it wasn't for sport. And we throw a lot away. Look at our eating styles. We don't want to eat the tongue or the heart or the, and I'm not saying everybody, but a lot of people would be like adverse to eating the pieces of the animal, like utilizing every bit of it or really knowing what to do with the hide to make it into a useful garment or something that brought warmth. I mean, I don't, clearly I'm out of my league. I'm not a hunter. I don't hundred percent know what I'm talking about. I just really admire that type of living within the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's important that you acknowledge that you aren't an expert in this, but no, I've never hunted. (laughs) I I haven't either. I haven't either, but that's part of why we're doing the podcast is because we are learning and we want to show that, hey, it's okay to not know all the things and it's okay to learn out loud. <laughs> you know, it's, it's okay to learn in front of other people. That's what we're doing here. We want to talk about some of the problematic things about Thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. And one of the myths is talking about the foundational myths of Thanksgiving, which we touched on already a little bit. One of the things that I came across in my research, I think this is something that people already know, is that the roots of Thanksgiving are incredibly complicated, very painful. There's a lot of violence mm-hmm. in it. Um, and there's a lot of betrayal, betrayal and murder, murder and stealing of land and stealing of things. And there's the settlers coming over, landing on the shores and thinking, oh, it's ours now because we set foot on it. Basically coming with that intention to take the land yeah, and then, and then bring their own type of religious freedom to the land, but really isn't religious freedom because it's their views about religious freedom. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Absolutely. Right. Because indigenous people were seen as heathens or wrong uncivilized uncivilized or because the settlers didn't really understand their ways they saw them as backwards or wrong right and they needed to either eradicate that or get that out of those people in order to bring them fully into civilization right you're touching on two really important points about uh, Thanksgiving and colonialism and all of that and religion and all of that and how it relates to indigenous people. One, knowing whose land you're on, um, because this land was here before any of us got here. This land was here and inhabited before the settlers got here. And so knowing right. which tribes lived on this land before we all got here. There's a really cool website that your niece found that I will actually put in the show notes. You can find out based on your address, which tribes lived on this land originally. And so you and I both put in our addresses and found who was here before we were. Mm -hmm. And for me here in, in Marietta, Georgia, which is for those who don't know, it's a suburb outside of Atlanta. Apparently this land was Muscogee Creek and Cherokee land, which that makes sense. I mean, the Southeast huge Cherokee population at the time. And then for Jennifer, for you in Michigan, it included, I mean, there's, there's a lot of tribes and I'm not, I'm not going to butcher the names. I don't want to be disrespectful and try to say them and then just butcher names. But, but one that I am pretty sure I can pronounce is uh, the Potawatomi tribe. Mm -hmm. So there, they were included in the group of tribes on the land that you now live on. Yeah. So I think it's important that we acknowledge the land that we live on. I think it's also important that we acknowledge that we acknowledge the role of religion in in all of that because because the myth we were told is that the settlers were coming here for their own religious freedom exactly exactly Mm -hmm. and 
that maybe there was some truth to that. Maybe there, that was a little part of it, but that wasn't the only thing. There's also the role of Christianity and specifically European colonial powers used the Catholic church's doctrine of discovery to establish domination and ownership over non-Christian peoples and their lands. The first document establishing the doctrine written by the Pope in 1095 AD declared any land in which Christians do not live was empty and open to conquest. A 1452 document gave Christian explorers full and free power to invade, conquer, fight, subjugate the Saracens and pagans and other infidels and other enemies of Christ and to lead their persons in perpetual servitude and appropriate realms. Oh my God. Yeah. But that's oh. always been my biggest beef with religion, to be honest, because it seems to me, and I, again, I'm no expert. I just live in my own quasi atheist spiritual world. But my biggest beef is all the wars, murder, hatred, killing, raping, plummaging that happens in the name of religion. Mm -hmm. Because God said, my religion is better than yours. Yep. And to me, I like look at that. And I think if there is this God, that's all loving, there is no room for that in this God's heart. God mm -hmm. does not say to people, go kill your brother because he believes differently than you. You must right. convince him to believe exactly like you or kill him. Mm -hmm. I just, mm -hmm. that is unfathomable to me. It just mm -hmm. doesn't make any sense. It's freaking ludicrous. And yeah. almost all of our wars, it seems to me, are either fought over religion or resources. Mm -hmm. Resources to like land or oil or coal or diamonds or I don't even know what I'm yeah. talking about because I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Well, no, but, but that but that's true. I mean, there's look at it. Look at wars that have happened. Even recently, they're they're fought over resources and access to the resources in those lands because we don't want somebody else to get those resources because we and, want and war makes a lot of money so <laughs> if our government can get us into the war machine they can crank out a lot of profit mm -hmm. you no know, mm -hmm. so I, that's a complicated one and we're getting off target but i just back to like this religious freedom they wanted religious freedom but only for themselves they wanted to squash everybody else's religious freedom so how is that religious freedom yeah, exactly. It's so complicated. I mean, I think complicated is the word of the day, basically. That's part of it. And just, I think, acknowledging that the history of the day is not this beautiful sunshine and rainbows and unicorns and glitter thing. Like, there's a, there's a very complicated history behind all that. That I think if we just put in the effort to try to educate ourselves and learn about these things like that. I mean, that's, that's the first step. I think but Raquel, does this go back to critical race theory? Because look at all these people who don't want us to change the way it's being taught in school. That's they true. want us to trace our fingers mm -hmm. and make a Turkey and say to our kids, also the words are wrong, but that the Indians and the pilgrims came yep. together and they danced and they ate corn and they had pumpkin pie and they loved each other and they had a nice celebration. Yeah. Yeah. That's and, what they and, want and, us to teach the kids. You're, That's, you're, you're, you're right on. You are right on in that. And why do parents not want us to teach the truth? I want to know that from the audience. Why don't you want us to teach the truth? What is it? Are you embarrassed? Are you disgusted? Or, or do you think that you can just continue to do your behaviors if you don't acknowledge what has happened in the past? Like, seriously, why? I wish we had someone on here who would debate us. Why? Why don't you want to tell the truth? Yeah, I'd like to know that. So if any of our listeners think that learning the truth is somehow going to harm your children or make them feel bad about themselves, or you don't think they're old enough to know these things, or you're just not comfortable with it, or if, if that doesn't apply to you, if you know people that what I just said applies to, then please let us know. I mean, we, we want to understand and, and maybe have some, some discussion around it. 
And, and I'm and talking about age no. appropriate, Raquel. We don't want right, to teach yeah. kindergartners that we massacred people. Oh gosh, right. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Exactly. We're talking about age appropriate learning and maybe stop some of this farce of these little plays that happen in the school that mm -hmm. glamorize it all and make it look in this nice, neat little package. Like maybe, maybe we we start with stopping the lie. Yeah. And then and then as kids get older, we teach them more of the truth. Right. And we teach the truth, not to shame people. We Shame is not, shame doesn't work for anybody. If we've learned anything in this podcast so far, shame just makes people dislike themselves. Nobody's trying to say, I want you to feel ashamed. I want you to dislike yourself. What we're trying to say is let's learn the truth mm -hmm. so that we can dissect what happened, make some amends and do better in the future. Yeah, become, so we can grow from it. Yeah, become better human beings. One way that I look at it is, and I, I had a similar conversation with somebody not too long ago of loving something enough to want it to be better. Yeah. Right? So whether it's people in your life or an organization that you work for or the country that you live in or what whatever it is, if you love something, you want it to be the best that it can be. And it, and that includes knowing the truth about it. You can't know where you're going if you don't know where you've been. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And actually, and this is something that I didn't know about until, and I just re realized it today. I have a, a calendar app on my phone, which I think probably everybody does. And I realized that the day after Thanksgiving shows up on my calendar as Native American Heritage Day. I have never noticed that before. I don't know if maybe I have just been clueless. Or I thought it was Black it was, Friday. Well, well, yeah, it is Black Friday, but you know, it's some, but it's also Native American Heritage Day. I didn't mm -hmm. know that. I, I didn't know it. I haven't heard anything about it really, but that doesn't mean it hasn't been talked about. It's just, I haven't seen it. So I did a little research before we hopped on and it's a civil holiday observed on the day after Thanksgiving, of course, here in the U.S. And what I found out was it was signed into law by President George W. Bush and introduced by a Democratic congressman from California, Joe Baca. Had oh, no, wow. Had no idea. And what it says is it encourages Americans of all backgrounds to observe Friday, the day after Thanksgiving, as Native American Heritage Day through appropriate ceremonies and activities. It also encourages public elementary and secondary schools to enhance student understanding of Native Americans by providing classroom instructions focusing on their history, achievements, and contributions. I kind of wonder if maybe that's going to get bigger, tossed out and, and, and lost in the shuffle oh. because of all the, the brouhaha with what people are calling and we now know is not exactly critical race theory. Right. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think that yes. maybe is going to get lost now. Hopefully yeah. it won't. But I also found that in the same document, which of course I will link to in our show notes, that in addition to calling Thanksgiving, the national day of mourning, some Native that. Americans, yeah, I did hear that, that some Native Americans believe that it's in poor taste for Native American Heritage Day to be on Black Friday, which is a day of excess and gluttony and greed and aggressive capitalism, mm -hmm. which itself falls after, and I'm quoting, it's all quoting, which itself falls after a holiday that omits the murder and mutilation of natives in which they mourn the estimated millions of indigenous people who died as a result of aggressive settler colonialism. So complicated. A lot, that's a lot. Complicated. So my personal feelings around the gluttony of Thanksgiving, we'll just start right there. I have, a lot of you know this, I've worked in retail for many, many years now. And one of the things that my family always did was we would celebrate our Thanksgiving on a different day because I would volunteer to work the entire day of Thanksgiving so other people could have it off. One of the things that has always been kind of rubbed me just a little bit raw on the Thanksgiving and 
all of these holidays, not, not just Thanksgiving, but Thanksgiving, Christmas, Mother's Day, Valentine's Day. I mean, you could just add to the list mm -hmm. is that they have be really become about what you can buy, yep. what you can purchase, what it looks like, you know, the Thanksgiving table, it's the food, first of all, right. the food, the turkey, the pumpkin pie, the stuffing, the yams, the, it goes on and on. But then it goes further. Do you have the proper place setting? Do you have beautiful napkins? Do you have a little this and that? And, and then maybe the proper wine. And it just seems like, it just seems to me like it's created as a way to get people to spend more money. Mm -hmm. It has been them. commercialized within an inch of its life there's a whole group of people that are somewhat excluded from that celebration mm -hmm. and people will come in and they'll go, Oh, I'm so sad. You have to be here working on Thanksgiving, but yet they're there shopping. Mm -hmm. That's the thing I've never really understood. Also, I didn't feel bad about working on Thanksgiving. I want to put that out there. There were many times when people would come in and say, Oh, thank you so much for being here. I was on the road my relative was in the hospital. I mm -hmm. didn't know I would be able to get turkey. This is so wonderful. And that made me feel valuable, proud, happy to be working where I was working. And I had come to terms and made the decision to work on Thanksgiving. But what I'm saying is that there is sort of a inequality of those people who believe that they need to be out there celebrating, but the whole group of service people need to be there mm -hmm. to serve them so that they can celebrate. Mm -hmm. That is always kind of a little catch 22 in the holiday to me. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I get that. I get that. Cause I've, I've worked retail before too. Yeah. And well, retail or restaurants, or mm -hmm. if you're part of a, a gas station, you're going to be open on the day. If you're part of the medical community, our hospitals don't stop on the holidays. The, the people who would respond to an emergency would be there. Our police officers, our EMTs, a, a lot of people work holidays and we yeah. just don't realize it. Well, I think we just don't think about it. Yeah. Like, I think if we drive around on a holiday, we a know lot of people, people work working, holidays, but we don't think about it. And like I said, I accepted that as part of my chosen profession. I knew I would be doing that and I was okay with it because I made arrangements. What bothers me is the mentality of some people that those service people should be there to take care of my needs so yeah. I can celebrate a holiday. That's yeah. the bothersome part. Yeah. Yeah. And that goes back to the things that we've touched on throughout the podcast of feelings of entitlement and mm. privilege and just not taking other people into account and not, not seeing things outside of your own square of existence. Yeah. I mean, I totally get that. And another thing about the whole commercialization and, and I don't know, just enormity of the holiday and and this isn't just with thanksgiving for me it's also with christmas and new years and all like like kind of like what you were saying with all the commercialization of all the holidays and can't turn around without seeing something in a store putting it right there in your face yeah holidays can be very difficult for people for a number of reasons there's always a financial component not everybody can oh my god it's so expensive to have this big bounty and this big spread or so maybe they don't have any of it you're made to feel bad if you don't have all those things or if you can't get home either if because you can't afford to get home whether you don't have a relationship with your family or if you're working if you're if you're part of basically the infrastructure of your city of first responders or medical community or whatever, you can't get home. So you're made to feel lonely just because of that one day. It's one day right? and you're made to feel lonely that day. Whereas any other day that you're working and can't get home, you don't feel, it's not necessarily like, oh, you can't get home. Oh, you it, know what I mean? Yeah. And so it can be a, it, it can be a really difficult time for people on a number of levels, I mean, it's financial, it can be mental, it can be emotional, it can be- Or the people who make difficult. it home on the holiday, but yet they're very uncomfortable in their home environment with their family. Like maybe their family doesn't accept their political views or mm -hmm. their family is not accepting their new pronouns or their mm -hmm. family doesn't like their choice in who they love 
or how mm-hmm. they live their life or I mean, there are lots of things that come up. I remember talking to someone and they said, holidays are horrible because when I go home, I have to be pretend to be someone that I'm not. Or when I go home, I feel like a little girl. I don't feel like an adult grown human being because I'm right back to where I was when I was a child. And I think those things can be tremendously stressful as well. Yeah, they really can. And I think one thing that I've seen, well, let me just talk personally for a minute about my own experience. We couldn't always have like big holidays. I mean, I've talked about this before that financially things were tough a lot of the time. For the most part, Thanksgiving was, it was more about the food for us and, and, you know, getting together and sharing a good meal. So that was great. It took some of that pressure off. As I got older, it was the whole, oh my God, our Thanksgiving doesn't look like what you see on TV, or Mm -hmm. it doesn't look like what Susie Q down the street did. Then as I went off to college, it was a lot of the school going off to law school and living in a different state and not always having the money to get home for the holidays. It was, it became this whole thing of, well, I'm here by myself. What am I going to do? Just sit here and I feel lonely on the day. What am I going to do? Sort of fits and starts. I would have, oh, well, you know what? Other friends can't go home for whatever reason. We'll do Thanksgiving together. And I do remember at one point, there was one where I hosted a Thanksgiving with just me and a couple of my friends who couldn't go home. And that was, it was lovely and it was very nice. And it, it really helped over the years. And more recently, I'd say maybe like in the last 10 years or so, you see more of people doing Friendsgiving, Friendsgiving right? Yep. Friendsgiving. And, yeah. Yep. And which I think is fantastic. Yeah. They've because been really good. Yeah. And then it's your family of choice, mm-hmm. you know, so you get to feel good about the day and you get to take that day back and make it about what you want. And you get to be yourself with yes. the people that know you as you. Yes, exactly. And you can do it however you want. I mean, you mm-hmm. can if you want it to just be a day where if you want to stay with tradition, fine. If you want to do something just outside of tradition and everybody just bring your favorite dish, fine. That's cool too. It's, it's what you want to make of it. That part of it is so healing mm-hmm. and, and soothing for me because I've had, I can't even tell you the last time I was with my family of origin for Thanksgiving, for a variety of reasons, not always just money, either, you know, weather challenges, because that's a tricky time of year to try to travel well, up yeah, to Michigan. Yeah. Maybe family just wasn't getting together and people were just like, nah, it's another day. We just don't feel like it. Okay. Then don't put that pressure on yourself. That's cool. Mm-hmm. I'll have Thanksgiving with friends or I'll make my own Thanksgiving and have Thanksgiving by myself and just make myself a really nice dinner. I like that that is so solution focused because the first scenario you were describing where people good couldn't get home for whatever reason and they were sitting alone and they were feeling bad and they were feeling lonely then you quickly turn that around with like a friendsgiving where you take the power into your own hands and you create the day that you want it to be for those working in retail it's a, why does it have to be that thursday why can't you do it friday saturday sunday whatever day tuesday yeah. if it works like really creating something that becomes your own celebration. And I, I just really like Friendsgiving way better than Thanksgiving. Yeah. Yeah. On a feminist viewpoint, one of my beefs with all of the holidays, and I'm going to rant a little bit, just like I ran it on the last one is that this is just another holiday in my opinion. And I know that there are some hardworking, lovely men out there, but where women take on the fucking buttload of the work, all of the cooking, most of the cleaning, planning, prep. Yes. has been for me, the holidays, really Halloween through the end of the year, through all Mm -hmm. of the stuff that happens, it is the most expensive time of the year. It's the most expensive time of the year because (laughs) everything costs so much freaking money. Yes. So not only are you planning, but you're also like shelling out. I I've put that stuff on my credit card to Mm -hmm. pay off months later, years later. Mm -hmm. And when I think back about it, when I think back about it, I think, why did I do that? Because that was the expectation. Yes, I was just going to ask about that. 
was to provide that. And now that I'm older and more secure in my, I'm like, no, we are not doing that anymore. It is just absolutely silly to put yourself in debt over these holidays. Yeah, it's to ridiculous. have the, the perfect lawn decorations, to have the big blow ups, to have the right pumpkin and then then move on to the right pie and the right this and the big fancy meal. And to be honest, as a mother, nobody eats that meal anyway. It's frustrating. <laughs> we years ago, we don't eat meat, so we don't have a turkey. And people would be like, get fake meat, do this, this. Now we make, this is the only time of year we eat this. We eat this at Christmas and New Year's. We make stovetop stuffing, mm. we make a vegan gravy we make mashed potatoes and that's what olivia and i eat and gabby eats mac and cheese and that's what we eat and sometimes i make cranberries because i like the cranberry sauce because it's a nice and tart but we don't we just don't mess with it anymore yeah that makes and sense in my family of origin the thing that used to irritate me so much is my mom would get up i don't know about your mom but my mom would get up at like 4 a.m get that turkey ready stuff it get it into the oven Family members would come, they would bring dishes to pass. Everyone would set up the table. My mom would start to get like harried. She'd start freaking out a little bit. And she'd be like, can you do this? And can you do that? And mostly it was women running around, yes. setting things yes. up, getting it together. Some men, I'm not going to say that there aren't helpful people out there. There are. We'd eat dinner. She spent hours and hours. You eat in like an hour is the longest, probably 30 minutes. But maybe if you're sitting and talking, you're like eating for an hour and you're enjoying each other. And then in our house, I don't know if everybody else's house, my mom, my grandma, my aunt, Omi, cleaning the dishes, cleaning them up, putting them away. And then they're plating up pie, putting some whipped cream, taking it to the men in the living room where they're snoring away, which I think is sweet. You know, it's a tradition and I'm not, it's not really a feminist holiday. Let's be real here. We're like, yeah. My mom used to get up at 4 a.m. to get that turkey ready. Yeah. A lot of people still- (laughs) do that yeah. every year and and my mom wasn't the one who did the cooking it was always either my grandma or my aunt Catherine my aunt Catherine oh my god poor thing she would start cooking days before yes, right because she would saying. start with all of the pies making all of the fillings of course you know from scratch then she gets things that she could get done days before but then the day of same thing. She would get up at before the crack of dawn to start that damn turkey or yep. some day, some years we would have uh, like Cornish game hens or whatever, but whatever the meat was, she was starting at the crack of dawn. Right. And, and it was a whole, just multiple days leading up to it of cooking. Yeah. To basically sit down and the food's gone or you're, you're <laughs> eating and like, yeah, it's gluttony. You're just, you're eating, you're scarfing that shit down in like 20 minutes. And not to say it's all bad because I enjoy cooking to some extent. And so I can see where someone who is, is a really good cook, who really enjoys the process of making a pie from scratch. That is a gift of love that they're giving to their family. I see that clearly a hundred percent. Yes. I also think it's really stressful. So I don't know where the balance is on that. I've, I've tried to come up with a balance myself. My parents were divorced. So we really did Thanksgiving with my mom and we did Christmas with my father. And so our Thanksgiving with my mom turned into kind of a Christmas celebration in a way. It's, it's a little weird. Yeah. And I think that's another thing that doesn't really get addressed much in the lore of Thanksgiving is what if you have a blended family or your parents are divorced and there's two different households or what if you're married and you've got your husband's family and then your family and then what about your own family what if you want to just spend thanksgiving yeah with your friends instead of trotting all over the country it can be a really stressful day and but i think a positive around it is that it gives people and i know this is hard i'm not saying this is easy for anybody but it gives you an opportunity to define that day for yourself and how you're going to celebrate it. And And I'm not so boundaries. Yeah. It gives you an opportunity to set boundaries and make that day look however you want it to look. If you feel empowered to do that, it took me some time to feel empowered to do that. Oh, absolutely. I think, and I think that's, that's true for most people. It's not easy to do. I'm, I'm, I get that. It's another opportunity to make it what you want it to be. Of course, this is a feminist podcast and we're talking about ways that we can, how can we 
make Thanksgiving a feminist holiday because essentially as it's portrayed and as we all live it out every year, not exactly a feminist holiday. So I think one of the things that I could have done, Raquel, and I'm mm -hmm. learning this is yeah. I could have verbalized or asked for what I needed a little bit more instead of being like, I'm the mom, I have to take on the cooking. I have to put the stuff out. I have to have everything looking and I have to pay for everything. Yeah. I could have asked for, Hey, can you all chip in? Hey, I cooked all the food. Would you mind doing some of the dishes? I could have asked for those things. I never did. I accepted that. Why I accepted that, but I accepted that as the expectation of the day. And I just did it. And to be honest, I wasn't mad about it. Mm -hmm. I would, I wasn't like hurt or anything, but I think we, I could have enjoyed a better holiday if I had learned to take care of my needs a little bit more mm -hmm. and been like, Hey, you know, I could sit down and relax if everyone was pitching in here. Right. And you know what, maybe that's, maybe that's a huge takeaway mm -hmm. from all of this is not just how to make it a feminist holiday, but how to make it a holiday that works for you is to set boundaries, yeah. find it for yourself and ask and ask for help. You delegate. You don't have to do it all. Yeah. You know, and that's a huge lesson for the rest of life. You don't have to do it all yourself. Yeah. And when people ask, they always ask, what can I bring? One of my things was like, nah, don't worry about it. Never. But I could like make a list and be like, yes. oh yeah, that would be great. If you brought the pie, if you, I mean, I don't have people coming anyway, but the point yeah. is people offer, yes. you could accept the offer. Absolutely. I've not been great at that in my life, accepting the offer. Yeah. I got to pay way more attention and be like, oh, the offer is legit. People want to help. They want to contribute to the day, accept the offer and ask for what it is I need. What yes. a great idea. Yeah. We and you know, life. There you go. Done. We just solved everybody's problems. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? You could even do that at home. I mean, you were saying you aren't having people come over. You could do that with your daughters. Like, hey, you do this part of it. You do this part. I'll do this part. And then together we'll do X, Y, Z. Or It'd be so nice, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I, is that going to happen this year? Maybe not. Maybe. But could get the wheels turning for next year. What yeah. were some of these things about making it into a feminist holiday? What does that mean? Okay. So basically making it more inclusive uh, is, is the, the gist of it. Addressing in the myth. We've talked about that, talking about that there's more to it than just the sunshiny, whatever that we were taught as kids, mm -hmm. um, but also to find positive ways to discuss race, gender, sexual orientation, all of the other issues or whatever you decide you want to address, but find positive ways to talk about those things at the table. Because when you think about it, these are, these are your people coming together, whether it's your friends or your family or however you look at it, how whoever's gathering together, it's an opportunity to have a discussion and you can have the discussion in a positive way. Or do you think maybe sometimes not having the discussion? Because I was thinking back when you said this to maybe the year that, or the years that Trump won the presidency when things were so tense. And I think they're still tense to some degree between Republicans and Democrats and families are divided, right? Mm -hmm. If you're all sitting at that table together, Maybe this isn't the best time to talk politics. That is that is a good point. That is a good point. And so the next point actually in this article is finding a way to make everyone feel safe and welcome. Mm. So whether it's like you were talking about people who they go home for the holidays and they feel like the little kid version of themselves yeah. or people who feel that they can't be fully themselves at home. Mm -hmm. What, or, or people who decide to do a gathering with their family of choice. The whole idea is around making everybody feel safe and welcome. And so maybe focusing on those aspects of the holiday of gathering together and being with each other and breaking bread and enjoying each other's company, focus on that as opposed to other things like politics or, you know, other things that might make things a little touchy. Well, to me, when I think about safe and welcome, the things that come to mind are, is 
the space appropriate? Like, is mm-hmm. there enough room or accommodations for everyone? For my mom, for example, mm-hmm. she's got Alzheimer's. We've talked about this. She can't really sit down and enjoy the whole meal. And also she's going to want to eat before everyone eats. She's just on her own time frame. In the past couple of years, I've tried to make her conform to what's happening. And then I just finally realized we all have a much better time if I just let her pick at the food and does it really matter? But you know, if someone had someone in your family needed a special chair or they couldn't sit for very long, they needed to have a walking after the meal, we need to get up and go for a walk. And then the other thing that comes to mind for me that's happened for us as a family is the food appropriate for everyone. Mm -hmm. Because I think of it as a vegetarian you think there's a lot of food that's vegetarian that's not because if they make the stuffing with chicken stock, it's not yeah. vegetarian. Yeah. So if they make the mashed potatoes with, I don't know, what would you put in mashed potatoes? But anyway, my point or, is- Or cheese and then it's not vegan. Yeah, which we had that issue for a while when Olivia was vegan. So if you are going to have guests, can they actually eat what's on the menu? And I think one of the most awkward things is going to someone's house and you want to partake in their food. You want to be nice about it. But if you really just, you can't eat it because it goes against your ethics, how could you eat it? And that could be with religious observation as well, Mm -hmm. or maybe what they're serving to drink. Maybe house, we, we don't do a whole lot of alcoholic beverages with a meal, but a lot of people do wine. But what if that made one of your guests uncomfortable or vice versa? What if they didn't want to come to a meal where we didn't have a nice glass of wine? It's just kind of like thinking those things out and is everyone comfortable? And I don't know, am I going overboard thinking that we need to think about what people want to eat? No, I don't think you're going overboard at all. I mean, I think that would be the case with any gathering that you're going to have at your home. If you're going to have just a regular plain old dinner party on any other random day of the year, it's common now to want to know if anybody has any dietary guidelines that they follow, whether it's because of religion or maybe they're following a particular way of eating or maybe they're allergic to something. Yeah. I have a niece who has really bad reaction to any type of soy in her food. Mm -hmm. And so we, even though we don't eat meat, if she comes for Thanksgiving, we have ham for her because Mm -hmm. she doesn't have enough options without having some kind of meat. And my mom eats meat too. So, right. Right. So I think it's, and this is something that is always a little bit of a stressor for me. And I think it's a stressor for a lot of people. And you brought it up before the expectation. Exactly. It's the expectation. Yeah. Just because it's Thanksgiving or Christmas or whatever, just because there's this drama around the day it puts extra pressure on pressure. Whereas any other time of the year, like I said, if you're going to have a dinner party, you'll ask whoever's coming to your party, uh, you know, is there anything that I need to be aware of that you can't or won't eat? My list is this long. You don't (laughs) want me to come to your house. No, no. I, I would want, I would want you to come to my house. And I, as somebody who likes to cook, I would find something to make that you would like that we all could enjoy. I wouldn't be like, okay, here's Jennifer's meal. And then we're all going to eat all this over here. Right. I mean, I would, I would just be happy you had a meal for me. (laughs) Well, yeah, but you don't want people to feel left out. I'm just, I wouldn't, I would want to find a meal that would be, that we all would enjoy that we all could actually eat. And it wouldn't just be, here's this one little side dish for Jennifer. And then everybody else gets like, you know, 48 plates of food. You want to make it welcoming for everybody. So, I mean, it has been the issue around food for my kids has been complicated because as they've gone to other relatives houses, they have not been as in tune with food Mm. choices. And so a lot of times I pack food. And I send them with what they need. Yeah, I think that's smart. That's smart. And, and unfortunately, people still need to do that. And maybe maybe that is starting to change. I mean, I hope it is. I think well, it might I mean, be. Sometimes people just don't even have the knowledge or I live close to Ann Arbor. We have a lot of restaurants, grocery stores, et cetera, that cater to people who are making different food choices. But there are other areas where those things aren't like standard practice. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I go up North camping and I want to eat at a restaurant, 
I have to order like a Reuben sandwich with no corned beef. And they always, they go, you don't want corned beef. <laughs> I'm like, no, I just want the sauerkraut and the cheese please. And they're like, what? Because it's just not the norm. And it right. just doesn't make sense to them. And that's yeah. really like the only option. That's yeah. really what they come to find. Wow. Yeah. So yeah. it's hard. Right. What are you going to do? Exactly. Make your own food. There you go. Well, and so another, uh, going back to the, how to make it a feminist holiday. Mm -hmm. Another thing that comes up and we've talked about this, like we've already touched on be inclusive in your food spread. So, you know, that's something. Another thing is abolish the division of labor based on gender. Yes. Yeah. But how do you do that? Well, what I see, one thing that comes to mind for me is if you did the cooking, you aren't doing the cleanup. That's perfect with me. I'll yeah. cook, you clean, we got it going on. Yeah. And then it doesn't have anything to do with gender. Yeah. It's whoever did the cooking, you get to go rest now. Other people, you're doing the cleanup. I hate cleaning. Yeah. I, I don't like cleaning. No. I hate it. I love cooking and I make the biggest mess when I cook. I am not neat and tidy. So I don't think anyone wants to clean up after me, but I don't like the cleanup. Yeah. Well, and you just fed them. So there you go. They can do some of the, the cleanup. Although I will note that I've gone to dinner parties or Thanksgiving or whatever celebrations at people's homes and kind of what you said before of you, you go, okay, what can I, what can I do? What can I bring? And they're like, and they no, no, you. I got it. No, yeah, they don't let you. if you have done all of this cooking and you've invited people over and they're like, okay, what can I do to help? Let them help you. Yeah, let, I think let them box stuff up. Just go, you know what? All the baggies and all the Tupperware and all the things are over here. Go, go for it. I'm going to go sit down and, and enjoy the game or watch a movie or whatever. Thank you for contributing. For me personally, that is the biggest lesson because when I talked about on our loneliness podcast and how I felt lonely because I was holding all the weight on my shoulders, mm -hmm. it really was a realization for me that I am the one that put that all on my shoulders, that mm -hmm. I felt like I had to do it. It was my expectation of myself. And since we have learned that, since we've talked it through on this podcast and in the therapy, and I have been really trying to open myself up to how can people help me in ways that feel good to me mm -hmm. in ways that, because it feels good to me, but it also feels good to them. Yes. If they come to your home and you don't allow them to do any of the giving, you're sort of hogging all the giving. You're robbing them of having the feeling the value and contributing and being part of this. You're taking it all on yourself feeling, I, I should say me, because this is my story. I'm taking it all on myself. I'm holding it on my shoulders. I'm feeling the weight of it. I'm not really mad at them because I've done it to myself, but then I'm like, why won't anyone help me? And they offer to help and I don't let them. That's what I've learned. Yes. And that has been so, so powerful and very powerful as I have been going into needing the surgeries for the HPV, for yeah. the cancer cells of how can people support me in ways that I feel comfortable with, mm -hmm. not their ideas of supporting me when they make the offer, how does it help me to feel good? And yep. do they feel okay about doing that? Like I'm not overstepping their boundaries either. Yes. It's yes. so That's interesting, huge. isn't it? It really is, is. It really that is, is so huge. It really is. And sometimes it, all I just really need is a nap. I yeah. just need someone to be out there and be responsible for a while so I can take a nap. Exactly. That's a huge, huge, huge takeaway. It really and, is. Um, for I'm me. I'm glad that you have come to that realization. That's amazing. Yeah. It's yeah. big. To see if I yeah. can do it through the holidays. Okay. Well, you know, that's a little, it's a little opportunity for growth for you. Not a challenge, an opportunity for growth. Okay. All right. I like that. So challenge, challenge accepted. <laughs> All right. Perfect. So what are you going to make the holiday work for you and your family? You're talking about Thanksgiving specifically? Well, yeah, but yeah. if you want to open it up and talk about other holidays, you can do that too. No. Well, Thanksgiving this year is a big unknown because I'm having my hysterectomy mm -hmm. 
five days before Thanksgiving. I don't honestly know what I'm doing. And I, I guess what I need to do for myself is talk to my family about their expectations, mm-hmm. about what they'd like to do, because I'd like to do very little. As you should, yeah. because you will be healing. My thought on this is that this is an opportunity for you to not do anything. To, well, yeah, to not do anything and to be okay with it. And to allow yourself to receive the help and the love from the people around you, because Mm -hmm. they may still want to do a version of Thanksgiving, but they may be thinking, oh, well, mom doesn't want to do anything because she's going to be, they can do everything and it can be their gift to you Mm -hmm. for Thanksgiving of, you know what, we're taking care of you and we're going to make this day what you can handle. I do want some pumpkin pie with whipped cream on it. I do want that. Right. There you go. You can have Uh, that. Yeah, probably. We'll see. What about you? What are, what are your thoughts for this year? Well, so the holidays for me over the last many years have been about being with my friends and people that I'm close to and people that I care about, right? It's not always oh, I have to go home to Nashville or I have to go home to Kalamazoo or, you know, whatever. It's, I want to spend the day with people that I can get to. I will be spending Thanksgiving with friends of mine that I spent Thanksgiving with last year. And it's sort of the same thing. They're like, you know what? We're opening our home. We're going to cook these things. We're inviting people. Come over if if you can if you can't stay for dinner, come for hors d'oeuvres or come afterwards for dessert or do what, you know, and so they just open their homes and I will be doing that. And I am going to take it as an opportunity to try a new recipe. So I'll be cooking and I'll be contributing that way. Um, Well, I am going to make, I found a recipe for, let me get the title right. French onion soup, mashed potatoes. So it's oh, yum. Uh, caramelized onions and Gruyere cheese and all kinds of other yummy goodness in with the mashed oh, Yeah, I'm coming potatoes. to your house. <laughs> mm-hmm. So yeah, I'm so coming that's to Michelle's house. Awesome. So that's what I'm doing for that. And then we all bring something, right? Like the the whoever's hosting will provide a few things and mm-hmm. then everybody else brings what, you know, another dish or something. Yeah. Or they'll bring like paper plates or what, you know, if you don't cook, bring some wine. If you don't drink wine, bring some paper plates. I mean, you know what I mean? Like everybody can, everybody pitches in. Yeah. Yeah. There's one of the parties that I'm going to, I am going to make, it's a, it's a fall salad and it's a recipe that I found from a chef friend of mine and it's quinoa, roasted butternut squash, goat cheese, Mm. apples and then like uh and there's some other stuff and then there's like a, a maple dijon vinaigrette so yeah so and i'll be making that. coming to your house that sounds <laughs> delicious yeah and oh and as a vegetarian you could have both of those dishes mm-hmm. and they're they're both like very substantial flavorful dishes. oh yeah they sound wonderful. Yeah. And you don't feel like, oh, I'm just having all the sides because no, you know, nobody wants to, get, I can't eat turkey and they're not going to make any accommodation. You, do you know what I mean? Like there's, it's more to it than just here's your salad. Yeah. Here's your iceberg with a tomato on it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. That sounds great. I think really maybe the message this year is Friendsgiving, mm-hmm. learning about the myths of Thanksgiving and really releasing the myth and being open to learning the truth. And then I hope in the next months, years to really learn more Mm -hmm. about what has come to pass and why, and, and maybe how we're still causing damage and maybe some ways to stop that. I don't know a lot, but I would like to be part of making things better. And I would be like, like to be part of making amends, however that comes to pass. And I I don't know how it comes to pass. I don't have the answers. I would like to see positive uplifting change based in 
I know this is going to sound corny, but based in the motivation of love versus the greed of this holiday, Mm because it does seem like a greedy gluttonous. I, I would just like to see us take that moment to really be thankful for what we have been provided. And I yep. think that's the whole point, isn't it? It is. I love that. I love the way you put that too, to approach it from an attitude of love and an attitude of inclusion. And, and like you said, we're both learning Yeah. as far as all of this and the myths and how to, how to make it right. And one thing that I hope to learn going forward is how can I be, how can I be a better ally? Or even an ally at all, because maybe I'm not even an ally at this point. I mean, I don't know. Maybe I've been, maybe I've been harmful and and unintentionally so, but I would like to know how to be an ally to indigenous people and to to abolishing the myths and the misinformation that's floating around out there. So if people, if our listeners know ways that we can become better allies. Hey, let us know. We're learning right along with y'all. So help us out. Yeah. 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 Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. And Raquel, I am really grateful that you want to do this podcast with me every week. I really enjoy it. I do too. I'm so grateful for our friendship. And for I'm getting all teary today. I oh now it's your turn. To cry. <laughs> That's not me. That's you. I'm not, You're- I'm not the only crybaby. No. But you know, I'm I'm so grateful that our friendship is is growing and flourishing as a result of doing this podcast and that we get to spend this time together and, and we're learning with each other and yeah. growing. And I'm so grateful for you. Yeah. Thank you for being on this journey with me. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Thanks everyone for listening today. We will be back with more Madness Cafe next week. You can find us on Instagram at Madness Cafe Podcast or email us at Madness Cafe Podcast at gmail.com. Bye.